Chapter 30, Hunters and Prey. What do you want to look out for? Two very angry types of movement. Slow, lumbering, powerful movements, and jerky, erratic, excitable movements. Both coming for the kill. Virtues. My first real advice, out of the stable, was to find my virtue. Well, no. It was to find a weapon, armor, and friends. And as daunting a task that seemed, I believed that I had succeeded admirably. It was the advice that followed to find that divining, positive characteristic that would get me through the darkest horrors that the equestrian wasteland could throw at me without losing myself. That still eluded me. Instead, I substituted other goals, other quests. I was driven to make this blasted world a better place, a brighter place, for the ponies trapped within it. I felt all my efforts had just hit a wall. Red Eye was just too smart, too devious, and too well organized. I underestimated him at every turn, and he used it against me with skill approaching Panache. Even his seemingly insane claim to approaching godhood was backed by a crafty and altogether horrifying plan. The sheer cruelty, the cold, calculating butchering of unicorns in an act that which would surpass murder struck a blow to my very soul. And yet, I could already envision his argument. What was the suffering death of a few dozen or possibly even hundred unicorns today for generations of safety and peace for millions in the future? I tasted bile. The goddess was insane, and yet she was effectively untouchable, immensely powerful, and her army of minions, while considerably smaller in number than Red Eyes, were amongst the most formidable opponents in the entire wasteland, and they were completely devoted, if not directly controlled, by her whims. And her whims amounted to our extinction. And she was such a potent telepath that even if I could come up with a plan, she would rip it from my mind before I could get close enough for her to implement it. We were racing epithesis, and we were losing. I felt the darkness closing in oppressively. If I ever needed a virtue to hold on to, it was now. But even virtues could turn on you. They could go astray, become warped or perverted. Watcher had told me the six greatest virtues of pony kind: kindness, laughter, generosity, honesty, loyalty, and magic. Although he made it clear that there are many others, and that my own was likely not to be on the sacred list. I had quibbled that I could possibly collect broken, wrecked versions of each of these. I was doing far better at it, it seemed, than finding ponies of true virtue. Still, I had been joking. Now I had met the goddess, the thing that was Trixie, and I knew I had witnessed the epitome of the corrupted virtue of magic. All I needed to do was find corrupted kindness, and I'd have a full set. Oh, but you have met corrupted kindness, little pip. The cruel, sweet voice of the goddess blasted through my head, swarmed with a chorus of whispers, mostly agreeing. The weight of her thoughts on my mind was heavy, almost suffocating. It's you. No, no, that was not right. She couldn't be right. I was better than that. I had to be better than that. But even as I fiercely denied the goddess's sadistic suggestion, my mind conjured up doubts and demons as if seeking to prove her right. I had saved the slaves of New Appaloosa, only to abandon them in the care of a town that traded with slavers. I had slaughtered a raider who raped and hunted a blue pony in Manhattan, only to walk away and leave her to fate more immediately threatening. How many more? How many other times had I inserted myself into a situation, tried to help, then left? Should I count all of Philadelphia as a victim of my kindness? I remembered my image in the mirror, reflecting my soul. 
Was Twisted Kindness what I had seen there? Was it a monster? No. No. This was sick, and poisonous thinking. It was the goddess, mercilessly tormenting me, where I was weak. I had a virtue. A good and true one, just waiting for me to discover it. I had to. We stepped out of Mariponi, most intact structure, and onto the angry daylight. Four of the goddess's alicorns guiding us back where the sky bandit had landed. My pet buck began to click at me. The bale fire bomb had been detonated underground here. The radiation bleeding off of the Splendid Valley sinkhole was nowhere near close to the horror of the Philadelphia crater. At least, not above ground. A nearby wall held what appeared to be a map of the building above a pair of water fountains. My pet buck's click clicking sped up ominously as we brought it close to them but I was more interested in scanning the map for future reference. I suspected I might need it. All around us, Alicorns watched silently from behind crumbled walls or stood amongst broken pillars and collapsed rubble. Their silent presence was eerie and sinister. Thriving? Velvet Remedy asked in a hushed voice, dripping her head. It feels more like they haunt the place. I nodded, lowering my voice to reply almost instinctually, as if all the unicorn's silence demanded that we speak softly. And have you noticed they haven't said anything? Not one of them had telepathically spoken a word since we encountered them in Splendid Valley. In previous encounters, they had been boastfully chatty. I think the proximity to the goddess is overwhelming them. Their individual minds are being drowned out by hers. This close, they become little more than drones. Now that I'm much cared for their individual personalities, Calamity chimed in, whispering. Seeing as they were all variations of goddess is great, rah rah us, y'all are insects, silence ain't entirely ungolden. After a moment of thought, he continued. I reckon it's the taint. Splendid Valley's rap with it, he pointed out. She seems to be able to communicate with her so-called children outside. But nothing like this. And not with normal folk, except in very special cases like Red Eye. But here, she's in our heads like it were nothing. I'm betting this whole valley is a massive amplifier to her. Wonderful. Well, I don't think any pony think about anything about what we're going to do now until we're out of this goddess forsaken place. Tell me to bark to laugh at my choice of phrasing. The alicorns, of course, said nothing. They wove us to the rubble, to the flat asphalt on which we had been landing, which had been landing zones for sky chariots. The sky bandit sat waiting for us. On the roof, Pyrolite danced and hooted at our return. Velvet Remedy stopped. Clamity hesitated, his ears perking up as he watched the bird. Hold up there, he whispered putting a foreleg out to block me. The four alicorns kept walking towards the sky bandit, either unaware or unconcerned that our change that their charges had stopped following. That sounds like a warning. Another alicorn dropped out of the sky, behind us, and raised her shield. It is, Velvet Remedy breathed. The four alicorns trotted up to the sky bandit, the lead one beginning to turn towards us expectantly. When the asphalt around them erupted into blasts of magical energy. All four alicorns were killed, three instantly, with two of them melting into goo, the fourth collapsing several yards away, missing multiple limbs and bleeding to death in a very pitiful way. Velvet Remedy's horn flared as her anesthetic spell allowed the creature to spend her last seconds without pain. The alicorns in the ruins around us stumbled in unison. Two more fell as shafts of colored light sliced through the air. Velvet Remedy muttered something, closing her eyes as her horn flared, and five small, flickering orbs of energy shot from the tip. One of the orbs drifted slowly over my head and floated there. One stayed above Velvet. The others sought a Calamity, Zenith, and Pyrelight, and hovered over them like tiny guardians. New spell? Velvet Remedy nodded, saying, I'll explain later, as she looked 
for a way to run. The alicorns in the ruins were bringing up their shields. The air was filling with magical energy blasts. A pack of hellhounds was charging across the tops of the rubble, moving with terrifying speed to engage the alicorns under the cover fire of more hellhounds in the valley. They'd mined the landing pad. My mind conjured images of hellhounds digging up from beneath until less than a half an inch asphalt separated their hoo holes from the above world, then wonder gluing the mines to that thin barrier and filling the holes behind them. Back inside, I shouted. Regroup first, and gather the line of fire. I turned, only to find we were blocked by the shielded alicorn standing behind us. Beyond her, the door back to the Maripony door stood dark and empty. The concrete steps leading up to it tore apart explosively as a hellhound burst out of the ground behind us. Massive claws ripped out through the alicorn shield and tore huge chunks of meat from her side as she turned to fight it. The alicorn almost got a spell off before the hellhound ripped his claws through her face, felling her. Insolent curse! A high-pitched voice whistled, blasted through the air and through my head. The goddess projecting both mental and magically through the ruins of Maripony air raised sirens. I pressed my hooves to my ears, but it didn't help. I was unable to think, unable to move under the assault. Calamity and Velvet Remedy and Zenith all did the same, only the Zebra seeming to get any respite from the effort. The Hellhound immediately fell, clutching his ears, howling in pain. The others cringed in pain, then turned, fleeing blindly back into the valley. The one in front of us did not fare so well. The three alicorns descended upon him, dropping their shields as they skewered the ambushing creature, driving glowing horns through his thick hide. One of the three was hit by a lancing beam of light, blue energy, and dissolved. A hellhound sniper, who was either far away enough to not be deliberated by the goddess's sonic slash telepathic attack, or who had protection from it. Clearly, not all these creatures were poor shots. An orange beam of light hit Calamity, striking him in the wing. For a brief moment, his whole body glowed orange, becoming a Calamity-shaped lamp. A little orb over his head popped, and the glow receded back to his wing before evaporating, leaving a hole in his wing that I could put my hoof through. Velvet Remedy's spell had saved him from being turned to ash. A Pegasus friend collapsed in shock. His scream drowned out by the goddess's attack. The siren stopped. The attack continued, but now the flurry of poorly aimed beams of magical energy were replaced by a small number of expertly aimed ones. The attacks flashed uselessly against the Alicorn shield. In the wake of the sonic attack, the hellhounds didn't charge the base again. I really should have worn my armor, Calamity grunted as Velvet Remedy fell over him, her horn glowing as she tried not to cry. Hey, at least I am bleeding out, right? The magical energy had warped the flesh of his wing around the wound and incinerated the feathers. Hush now, she ordered. Quiet now. Save your strength and let your medical pony do her work. From her pained expression, I could tell it was bad. Another bolt of energy struck the rubble, we had taken refuge behind. The alicorns had flown out to strike deep, or to strike down the snipers. But every time they got close, the hellhounds disappeared into the ground. All they were managing to do is get drawn further from the base and increasingly separated. The goddess had been recalling several, either suspecting or experiencing a trap. Did you see how all the creatures reacted when the first four were killed? Zenith asked, as she hunted through her pouch of bottles and ingredients. If the Trixie monster experiences each alicorn's death, perhaps the death of many at once is painful or disorienting to her. I nodded, filing that away for examination when we were safely outside the goddess's range. I looked to Velvet and asked, Will he be okay? Will he be able to fly again? Velvet Remedy took longer to answer than I would have preferred. 
I can repair the structural damage of his wing with my mending spell, but I can't heal the wound. You'll need at least one extra strength restoration potion to begin the healing properly. More, if he wants to fly any time this week. Right now, we do not even possess a healing potion. She looked at me sadly. If you'll remember, I used up all our medical supplies patching you up. Outside, stable too. I felt a pang of guilt. Quite a spell you got there, Calamity praised, resolutely ignoring his doctor's orders. He saved my life. Only the slightest smile touched Velvet Lemony's frowning expression. Yes, I had hoped to barter for more medical supplies from Dr. Helping Hoof, but with Ten Pony Tower surrounded by Red Eye's forces, he wasn't willing to part with anything more than a few healing bandages. So I spent part of my time learning a couple of new spells. A disintegration ward seemed prudent. Zenith pulled out a vial and offered it to Velvet. She took it and wrapped it in a telekinetic sheath, keeping it floating nearby. She scowled as she added. Unfortunately, his wing needs more than my spells and some bandages to heal. I'm going to need to cut the warped flesh away before I can start rebuilding and mending the bones of your wing, Velvet Remedy insisted remorsely, addressing Calamity. This is magical damage. If I do not remove all the affected flesh, your wing will never heal properly. You're going to bleed a lot when I do so, but Xena has given me something that should reduce the blood loss. She frowned. This would be excruciating, so I'm going to have to use my anesthetic spell. You're not going to be able to move for the better part of an hour. A beam of pink light struck above the doorway to Maripony. A center block's worth of the wall glowed and dissolved. Zenith turned to me. You made the wall, the wagon fly before. Can you fly us away from here? I shook my head. I've been asking myself the same thing. I can. Well, floating myself is incredibly deteraining. I don't think I'd be able to get us very far. Even if I could, I can't move us very fast. And all those hellhound snipers would need is one good shot to blow us up. Then, we are trapped here until we find mythical supplies for the winged one. Dang, girl. Have you just not learned our names yet? I'm Calamity. My apologies, Calamity. I am not used to thinking in names or to beings. The ex-slave zebra was clearly having difficulty putting her feelings into words. On a level of familiarity where names are appropriate for me to utter. I could have sworn I'd heard her refer to at least one of us by name before, but now that I thought about it, I couldn't place an instance. The closest I could come was her questioning how Calamity got his name. Only the largest figures in her life had been given names, Red Eye and Cern, who ruled those who had enslaved her, or figures of legend like Doom Bunny and Nightmare Moon. She'd kept her silence for how many years? I knew how impossible it had seemed to form friendships with my peers in Stable 2, having been in the awkward blank flank with the alcoholic mother. Being a zebra in the Philadelphia slave pits would have been even worse. I wondered if she ever bothered to learn the names of most of her tormentors. Is this the way she had come to identify ponies in her mind? Do you believe there are many medical supplies in here? Zenith asked, looking towards Maripony. I checked my Pitbox auto mapping feature, as well as the scan of the wall map. Sorrow, Maripony's medical clinic was in the section that had collapsed into the crater. Anything that had been in there would have been crushed, scattered, and probably tainted. There were bathrooms that might have medical medical boxes, but would they be in stock with the sort of supplies Calamity needed? I felt it was doubtful, and I wasn't eager to try. The horror of what lurked in there, and what she had done, curdled my blood. I knew the goddess needed us, but what if she changed her mind? I didn't want us to suffer the same fate as Twilight Sparkle. There's a hospital a few miles from here, Calamity announced, surprising all of us. Part of the gem mine in town that served this place. 
When they shut down the mines, the town was abandoned. But they opened parts of it back up to house ponies, who worked at Merritt Pony, and their families. I didn't ask how we knew any of this. Calamity had survived in the Equestrian Wasteland for many years before we met. Who knew what rumors and scraps of information he had learned? I was content just to be thankful for this change in our luck. Another shot struck the wall I was hiding behind, causing it to glow and melt. I scooted my tail another bit to another bit of cover. We weren't going anywhere until they stopped taking so many of our so many pot shots in our direction. And there should be plenty of rooftops to hide out on while I heal, Calamity assured us. Ain't perfect, but probably the safest place from the hellhounds. If we can get out of here. We all knew we were talking about several miles travel over hellhound infested radiation and taint soaked landscape. Just point the way, Calamity, I said, sounding more sure than I felt. I have a plan. You always do, Calamity grinned. Just get us to old Olne, and we'll be fine. The hellhounds seemed to lose interest after about an hour. It made me wonder if there was a larger purpose behind the attack, or if this had just been sport. I started the railing, ringing Mariponi's short water tower, my binoculars floating in front of my face. From here, I could just make out the shapes of old Olne in the distance resting peacefully. An elevated highway passed nearby, going nowhere. The highway had collapsed less than half a mile beyond the off-ramp to the town, leaving a line of rubble and crushed wagons. By time, and the valley had mostly succeeded in erasing. Turning my gaze towards the horizon, I glimpsed a shadow that may have been Ponyville. Beyond that, the sky turned hazy and thick from the smoke of the Everfree fires. Walking around the rim, I realized I could spot three of those needle-like towers rising into the cloudy heavens above. I was fairly sure that one of them was the same one I had spotted on the outskirts of Cloudsdale, but I hadn't been able to see the others before. Coming full circle, I looked back again at Old Olne, then traced the path we would take to travel to get there. A set of train tracks that stretch from Old Olne to Maripone, crossing rocky flatland with only minor undulations, save for a gulch filled with hints of shaggy vegetation and sick, stagnant water. I couldn't make out any details, but the plants beneath the bridge moved as if there was a much stronger wind blowing down the gulch than the faint breeze that stirred my mane. My view turned black as an aliquin flew across my narrow scope of vision, obscuring the landscape. I put away binoculars, hurrying to back down. More aliquins were beginning to return. The ones already here had returned to their silent lurking, seeming to pay us no attention. I was expecting either the goddess or her aliquins to attempt another escort, but it was almost as if they had forgotten we were here. Yet, that was impossible. They kept looking right at us. Maybe the goddess was gauging what we would do next. Or maybe she was recovering. She had lost quite a few of her children over the space of an hour. I wasn't the only one who found this behavior bizarre. Howdy, Calamity said, trotting shakily up to one of the dark purple holocorns and hovering a hoof in her face. Remember us? The ponies y'all wanted to find your stuff for you? you got a hurt wing here. If one of y'all could care to hit yourselves up, we could be out of your mane much faster. He turned to me, wobbling a little from the last faded efforts of the anesthetic spell. This is weird, right? Maybe the goddess is taking a great and powerful nap, Zenith suggested. Clemity snorted a laugh that ended in a wince. Hi, hey, Zenith. Calamity suddenly announced. I never said it, but I just wanted to tell you, I'm glad you're free and all. Merciful Celestia, Calamity. Awkward much? Zenith looked at him quietly, then said simply, Thank you. Calamity chewed on that, 
Then try it again. So, these potions you brew, any of them good for strengthening armor or helping with equipment maintenance? No, Zenith answered, seeming to understand his intention. She offered politely. I do know many poisonous brews, should you be looking to make your bullets more lethal. I felt for him. He was trying to connect with a new member of our group. He had been the most welcoming to her, trusting my judgment. But since then, they hadn't really bonded the quiet way Zenith and Velvet Remedy had, or even established the sort of relationship. Would rivalry be the best word? Grudging respect? Was that Zenith and Steelu shared. They were friendly acquaintances, and I suspected Calamity was trying to find a way to turn that into a true friendship. Calamity trotted around the alicorn. She turned lethargically, keeping him in her sight. I'm tempted to start shooting at him. Take out as many as we can. Velvet shot him a look of alarm, and he backed down with a grin. Ah, uh, didn't say I was gonna. I just said I was tempted. Zenith shook her head. We should make the most of this respite and implement the little one's plan without interference. I floated Calamity's Enclave armor out of the Sky Bandit, as well as Spitfire's Thunder and their other vital equipment. I didn't want anyone trotting up to it when the area around the passenger wagon could still be mine. As I placed our equipment in the center of a large husk of capsized wall, Velvet called us to gather close. Pyrolite landed on her back, puffing herself up and looking important. As a precaution, Vel was going to cast another ward against disintegration upon us. I'd been watching Calamity when his orb burst, but I hadn't realized the ones over the rest of us had disappeared simultaneously. I can cast a spell over multiple friends, Velvet explained as she recast her spell, but it collapses after any of you are hit, so please be dears and try not to get shot. She turned towards me. Especially you. I really hate this idea. You're too vulnerable. Why is it you are always the one in the most danger, little Pip? But she knew the answer. We'd been over this before. All my friends gathered on the slab of concrete as I wrapped them in it. In a levitation field. Velva turned to help Calamity into the Enclave armor, being extremely careful of his partially mended wing. She was wearing the zebra armor again, insisting we minimize the risk as much as possible. Particularly since little Pip seems insistent on taking more than her fair share. I floated the chunk of Mariponi's wall upward, not stopping until I was at least four stories above me. I was counting on the concrete to shield them from the Hellhound's magical energy weapons. I understood Velvet Remedy's concern, but this time it couldn't be helped. My telekinetic magic had grown strong enough that I could float this large section of the wall and all them on it easily, but adding myself to the mix would create such a strain that I would be lucky to make it halfway without suffering burnout. I agreed to lighten myself enough to prevent my hoof step from triggering mines or announcing my presence to any hellhounds who might be lurking just beneath the surface. But that was all. In the end, Velvet Remedy had to accept it. It had to be me. I started forward, moving around the ruins of Mariponi. The slab of wall with my friends on it floated high above me. While I would not say as much, I was grateful to be able to take the risk in their place. Was this something corrupted kindness would do? As soon as I had that thought, I pushed it out of my mind. I couldn't afford self-doubt now. As I reached the cracked edge of the Mariponi base, I hesitated. My pit buck was click-clicking, warning me of radiation, but there was no sound, no special display on my EFS designed to warn me of taint. Old Olne suddenly felt a very, very long way away. Splotches of red on my EFS compass alerted me to more threats. I floated the zebra rifle close and slipped into sats, even as I trotted. I was pacing myself, advice from a book, 
The Egghead's Guide to Running, that I perused from Twilight Sparkles and Atheum during one of the hours where Homage was playing DJ Phone 3 and giving me a chance to catch my breath. I had several miles to go, and I wanted to make the distance as quickly as possible, which surprisingly meant not pushing myself as fast as I could go. A spiny dart hit my side, bouncing harmlessly off my armor barding. My targeting spell latched on to the first bloat sprite, then the second. I fired off a throwdown burst at each, and the taint swollen bugs erupted into flames as they fell to the ground. I continued to trot along the tracks, quickening my pace just a little to make up for seconds lost while shooting. The wall holding my friends floated high above me, keeping pace. We were nearing the gulch. My skin was beginning to itch in strange places. I fretted, wondering if it was nerves or an allergic reaction, or worse, the first symptoms of taint. My EFS compass filled with red. Dozens of little lights appeared. Then more. The gulch was swarming with hostile life. I trotted onto the tracks and prepared to break into a gallop, hoping that the rather rickety wooden bridge would offer me protection. Something bobbed up over the edge of the gulch. I shuddered, staring at a taint mutated thing. It looked like a plant, its huge head covered in gas sacks that allowed it to float, the stalk dropping down and dragging behind it. A sphincter in the center of its head tightened and then spit foul goop at me. The spore laden effluent shattered on the ground near my hooves, sending up a choking stink. The equestrian wasteland never seemed to be running out of new vilenesses. Several nearby identical floating spitter plants were moving up out of the gorge towards me. I slipped into sats again, locking targets on the nearest two, and sending three, a two three-round bursts into the sphincter heads of each monster as a third sprayed its filth at me. I felt the crud splash against my armor and coat burning where it touched, and causing me to drop my targeting spell as I gagged in the stench. The two floaters I hit ignited spectacularly. The gas pods that gave them mobility rupturing into flame like miniature versions of Pinkie Pie balloons. Three more of the floating spitter plants rushed up from the gulch, one hitting the burning form of the first one and igniting explosively itself. The second spit its spores sewage at me, while the third changed or charged towards me as if intending to latch on and devour. I cantered to the side, dodging, and spit dodging the spit and bucked sats up once more. Targeting the charging one first, and then the one which had successfully hit me. Bullets burst from the silenced muzzle of the zebra rifle. The two targeted plants became flailing columns of fire, but the floaters kept coming. I dropped the targeting spell and brought it back up immediately, targeting two more. One of the burning plants spit at me, its spore sp sewage now on fire. Mercifully, the burning crud splashed across the tracks behind me, missing by a yard. My skin was beginning to really hurt where I had been hit, dropping out of sats again and shook, flinging the gloop away from me. Then lifted the rifle and brought up the targeting spell again firing at the advancing, half-burning herd of plants. One of the burning floater, burning floater plants tumbled back into the gulch. I could hear more gas bladders catching fire and bursting as the rapid chain reaction quickly set several hundred yards of the gulch ablaze. I sprinted, galloping across the wooden bridge as flames from the gulch began to look at it. Fierce heat and a choking reek buffeted me as I forced myself across, my eyes stinging. Several of the plants in the conflagulation blew spit-burning spore sewage at me, most to the bridge, setting it properly ablaze. Burning effluent struck me in my left flank, my hind leg, and saddlebags catching fire. I bit down, knowing that a scream could bring hellhounds. I pushed, running as hard as I could, my legs in searing pain. I was pouring concentration into levitating the wall now the physical agony threatening to break my spell. The fire was spreading at my side. It hurt to breathe. 
Flames looked at my hooves, burning them. I did scream. I was almost across the bridge. The gulch below, a writhing river of flame. When the hellhound tore out of the ground, alerted by my scream. But he was far enough ahead of me that Calamity could target him from the platform above. Four blasts of magical energy, knifed down from above, melting the hellhound in the colored sludge. I began to lower the wall, choking on the smoke and the stench of my own burning coat, knowing that I wouldn't be able to hold it much longer. It was three yards above the ground when the pain overwhelmed me and I dropped it. I made it to the end of the bridge in a slumped gallop and collapsed, rolling on the ground, squirming as I put out the fire on my left side, screaming. Just get to old Olney and everything will be fine, Zina chimed, her exotic voice taking a mocking tone as she peered at the town below through my binoculars. We had made it to the top of the overpass and were looking down at old Olney from above. From here, we could see dozens of hellhounds lurking about the town, a couple even on the rooftops. Gall dang it, why do you ponies ever listen to me? Clemity asked. I ain't little Pip. Y'all know my plans ain't worth shit. I flopped over, telekinetically floating the binoculars to my eyes. I still couldn't s feel anything. Velvet Remedy's anesthetic spell was doing its work, but that didn't prevent me from using my levitation spell. In fact, it almost made it easier. I had spent the second half making myself light enough for Pyrolite to carry, while I floated up the others and the wall behind us. The older unicorn had wasted no time in wrapping me with the rest of our medical bandages, and she scolded me on taking on yet another gruesome attack for the team. But with the pain gone, and out of the choking smoke, I felt assured that I had done the right thing. There was something wrong with me. I could feel it where the spit hit me. Something crawling beneath my skin that even Velvet Spell couldn't cover. I had floated my own forehoof so I could check my Pitbox medical diagnostic spell. It confirmed that I was suffering from something, but it couldn't determine what that something was. It wasn't poison, and I checked clean for spore infestation. No, the spore sewage of those floating plants had been laced with taint. I never believed I could have made the distance without exposure to Tang. I had never been that lucky. Rather, it would have been a matter of how much exposure and how quickly Tang took its toll. I knew that the society keeping Tempony Tower's secrets possible or possessed a spell that could purge Tang itself, although I didn't know if it could reverse the damage caused by it. That would be my hope. The ruins of Old Olney included several nearly intact buildings, one of which was the hospital. Sitting on the roof was a contraption that I'd never seen before, colored like a pink and yellow candy cane with a periwinkle propeller and blades affixed to the top of it. What's that? I asked, pointing it out. I believe that's an Earth Pony Sky Wagon, Clamity said. Trust it to an earth pony to find a way to fly. I could use that. No more running on the ground as I levitated the others in safety. Do you think it still works? I asked, hopefully. Nope, Calamity said, deflating my daydream of floating everyone up behind me while keeping safe distance off the ground in the earth pony contraption. But then he added, But I'll bet I can fix her up so she will. Hope resurrected. Perfect, because that's our plan B. I looked over the rest of the town, noting a strange glowing antenna array almost among several crates and barricades on a roof access the street, across the street from the hospital and a scattering of old military vehicles on the road. There was a capsized wagon with metal boxes scattered around it and a heavy tank half sunken into the ground. Instead of a normal earth tone or camouflage coloration, the tank can be painted in bright, multicolored stripes. 
The paint job was old and faded, but it still added a surprising splash of color to the town. I laughed. That tank looks like a rainbow. I can think of no logical reason for it to be that way. Really? Is that what they look like? Zenith asked. At my questioning, she exp at my questioning expression, she explained, I've never seen a rainbow. I first found the zebra's assertion impossible, then tragically sad, then curious. I looked up at the clouds that sealed us off from the sky. I'd seen it rain here. In fact, it seemed to rain a lot. But I'd never seen a rainbow outside, except in posters and illustrations. In fact, the only real rainbows I'd ever seen were in Stable 2, when the apple orchard sprayers were on. The Overmare's artificial sunlight would stream through the mist, creating shimmer in arcs of bright color. I used to beg my mother to let me play in them when I was younger. She even let me once. Yep, Calamity said, in answer to my own thoughts. To get a real rainbow, you need either magic or direct sunlight. Ain't been a proper rainbow in equestrian wasteland, probably ever. He thought a moment, then added, Sep, maybe in the Everfree Forest, since the clouds cover gets mighty fragmented there. I exchanged looks with Velvet Remedy as a knife slipped into my heart. I had never thought to miss them until I realized we were living in a world without rainbows. I'm going to shoot him, Clamity announced, before picking up Spitfire's thunder in his teeth and aiming it over the concrete railing of the overpass, taking aim for one of the hellhounds in the town below. No, Zenith hissed, pushing Spitfire's thunder away with a hoof. If you shoot them, then, they will let, then you will let them know that we are here. Wait, Velvet Remedy started to suggest, but my focus was on Calamity and Zenith, and their focus was on each other. Calamity started to say something through the gun bit, then put the weapon down to properly argue. Yep, I figure I can pick off a couple before they realize where the shots are coming from. Then, more as they come out of the buildings to investigate. Let them come running towards us. We got plenty of space between here and there to snipe them off in. I was already playing on my own sniper rifle, levitating my anesthetized body into an optimal sniping position. Little Pip, wait, Velvet said, but her next words were cut off by our zebra companion. Are you fools? Zena trotted in place. This is not how you behave in enemy territory. Our enemy outnumbers us, and these are not stupid raiders, but clever opponents. You do not engage them wantonly. Clemity cocked his head. And what would you have us do? Hide and seek? Yes, Zenith added firmly. Be alert. Move fast. Keep downwind and to the shadows. Avoid them whenever possible. Kill only those that we cannot avoid. And do so swiftly and silently. Clemity looked to me. I say we take out what we can, while we can do so from a distance. Less of them now means less to worry about fighting up close. Zena sighed, stepping between Calamity and me, facing him. Listen to me. I have watched you. You are a hunter. You know how to hunt. But do you know how to be prey? Clamity took a step back, lifting the bug-eyed visor from his enclave armor to stare back at her directly. I ain't got no interest in being prey. Well, I have spent most of my life as prey, and I know how to survive when you are outnumbered and chased," Zenith informed him. Perhaps you should listen. Clamity look, again looked past her, towards me. Lil Pip, your call. Zenith turned towards me too. I weighed the options, but ultimately, the tactics I knew won out. I agree with Calamity. We pick off what we can now, before heading in. I floated up the sniper rifle, loading armor-piercing rounds and taking aim. From this distance, I couldn't use my targeting spell to help me, but I had no trouble lining up a headshot just through the scope. Zenith nickered, shaking her head. Calamity picked Spitfire's Thunder up off the asphalt of the overpass and took position 20 yards away from me. 
Damn it, wait! I heard Valremity shout, but I had already pulled the trigger. Blam! Blam! The air filled with the sounds of ear splitting thunder as we began to fire down on old Olne. I watched as the head of the head health hellhound in my sight burst into bloody spray. I moved to acquire my next target. The hellhounds were all looking up now, turning, beginning to move. I found a second and fired, but the creature moved too fast. I aimed ahead of him, firing a second shot, and then a third. I was no longer to aim, able to aim for a specific part of the body. I was just hoping to hit him at all. My second shot did, but only slowed him down. The third missed entirely. I kept trying. Several shots back, beams of magical energy cut through the air. But we were too far away and too well protected by the overpass to be in danger of anything other than direct dedicated sniper. Calamity was having better luck. Every shot hit his target, crippling or killing. He started picking off the ones in the street as I turned my focus to those just coming out of doorways. That worked better. I felt a second and a third. Ah, crap! Clamity hissed as the hellhound he had turned his aim on dove to the ground, digging through the street like it was wet toilet paper. Clamity fired, blowing the creature's tail off as it disappeared. They weren't coming out of doors anymore. And as I looked up, I saw the last of the hellhounds on the street disappear into a hole. We had killed ten of them. Well, brilliant, Velvet Remedy face hoofed. Both of you. Now they know we're here, and we've attacked them first. She looked cross. Clemity winged his wounded wing. Ma Wing disagrees. Velvet Remedy's ears drooped. Now, Zena told Clamity, you are prey. We are all prey. They came for us on the overpass, while I was still paralyzed from the anesthetic spell. The hellhounds weren't foolish enough to come running up on the ramp like we had hoped. Instead, they dug their powerful claws into the pier beneath us and began to climb. The first one clawed its way over the railing, almost on top of us. Pyrolite was the fastest to react, filling it with a face full of radioactive green flame. Calamity recovered quickly, firing two of the Nova Surge rifles in his enclave armor directly into the hellhound's torso as it lashed out with his claws, barely missing the Veilfire Phoenix. The monster tilted back, dissolving. They're coming up from beneath us, Zenith warned before turning to dig, her, dig in her satchel. Velvet Remedy cooed to Pyrolite. Would you be so kind as to burn them off the pier? Pyrolite hooted happily and leapt over the edge. I could hear the roar of flames beneath. Parlight was able to take out two of them before more on the ground abandoned climbing and started shooting at her. She appeared, dodging and weaving between shots as the magical energy attacks drove her away from the overpass and the ponies she was protecting. Zia produced a bottle and passed it to Velvet Remedy. Dip your slugs in this before you load them, she instructed. The poison will cripple the creatures if your shot isn't enough to kill them. Velvet Remedy opened her combat shotgun floating out the slugs and dipping them, as instructed, a grim look on her face. Two more crawled over the railing. I was ready this time, floating up little Macintosh as I slipped into sats and fired into their heads. The hellhound's brains splashed out of the exit wounds. Three more replaced the two I had just killed, and the sound of rending concrete warned me that they were digging directly up through the overpass from the top of the pier. Velvet Remedy did an aesthetic spell, hit one of the hellhounds, causing the creature to fall. She lifted her shotgun towards another, and hesitated. The hellhound lashed out at her, his claws slashing shallow lines of red across her breast and throat as I telekinetically shoved her back. Surrender, she offered to the creature. Don't make me hurt you. God dang it, Calamity shouted, firing a bevy of magical energy bolts into the hellhound. The creature collapsed into a steaming puddle, leaving Velvet Remedy and Calamity staring at each other through the rising smoke. Don't reason with them. They ain't interested. They're people, 
she shouted back. They have a right to live. Y'all heard the zebra, Calamity shouted, turning to fire at another hellhound as he dug up through the overpass asphalt. They're hunting us. And whose fault is that? She quibbled back, loudly, throwing a protective shield around Zenith. The hellhound's claws tore through the velvet shield like it was made of colored air. The zebra stepped inside the attack, raising on her hind legs and throwing up one hoof to stop the monster's swinging arm, while driving the other hoof against the thick hide of his throat. The hellhound collapsed, choking. Has any pony even tried just talking to them? Velva cried out in exasperation. I reloaded little Macintosh as quickly as I could. They were coming faster now. It was getting harder to put them down as quickly as they surfaced. And one good swipe from their claws could kill any one of us. They were bloody hellhound corpses and piles of sludge all around us. We managed to cure, kill nearly ten more, miraculously, without getting ki crippled or killed ourselves. Even if Velvet Remedy had a point, it was far too late now. I told her so as I fired point blank at a hellhound and somehow missed. The creature bore down on me with its claws. Velvet Remedy sang a high pitched single note. The hellhound immediately fell back, its claws and paws. Or its clawed paws covering its ears. It turned and fled back down the hole. It had come down so fast that I didn't have time to bring up my targeting spell and shoot it in the back. Velvet continued to hold the note, clear and strong. I looked around, and the other hellhounds were disappearing, fleeing the overpass. Once they were all gone, Velvet's voice finally broke. Panting, she fixed us all with a glare. Savage animals and monsters are one thing, but with people, there's usually a way that doesn't require killing each other. We moved cautiously into Old Olne. The sun was beginning to set, and I wanted to get into the hospital and out again before the coming darkness put us at an even greater disadvantage. We were taking Zenith's advice now, not engaging, moving swiftly and quietly. One of the group of us, only Velvet Remedy, was unskilled at stealth. So I was floating her along with us. The faint glow from my horn was shining around her, and it worried me. It was like I was painting her as a target. But, from our experiences, it seemed the Hellhounds hunted by sound more than sight. Possibly by scent as well. So I felt it more important to keep her hooves off the ground. As we pushed through the remains of the building, I spotted several pony-shaped figures lying on the ground of a floor above us through a collapsed section of ceiling. I waved a hoof at the others. Hold up. I want to take a look. As I levitated through the hole, I could see the bodies were steel rangers, three of them clad in metal armor, and a fourth who was not. The fourth sparked my curiosity. A yellow unicorn mare wearing thick armor red robes, with the sparks and gears symbol of the steel rangers embroidered on it. I had not seen a ranger wearing anything other than steel armor, save for Elder Blueberry Saber. All four of them had died from terrible wounds inflicted by Hellhound Claws. Their bodies were desecrated. They had been here for quite some time. The Hellhounds had mined the floor around the bodies, and one by one, I disarmed them. I began scavenging the bodies, searching for any clues as to what these four were doing in Old Olne, as well as any supplies or ammo that might benefit us. I was in luck. The robed pony had two stealth bucks and a memory orb. One of the other rangers had magically enhanced ammunition that was of the same caliber as Calamity's normal battle saddle. I brought my treasures back to the others. You ain't planning on looking at that here memory orb. Over well, an old Olne, right? Calamity said with a gentle warning. Y'all remember our little talk, don't you? I nodded solemnly. I Pinkie Pie swear. You what now? Never mind. I'll tell you later. And yes, I promise. As we moved to the edge of the street, my EFS warned me that there were at least four hellhounds around the corner. I halted everyone. 
We might be able to take them. We had surprise. But it would only take one good swipe of them to behead one of us. And the fight would draw others. No. We would continue to follow Zenith's advice. I motioned everyone back the other way. I hate this, Clamity muttered in a whisper. I want to hunt the hunters, not play these scurrying games. I ain't a rabbit. Zenith gave a weary smile. Humility does not come easy to you, does it? Clamity turned to her. What's that supposed to mean? Are you saying I'm a show-off? She wouldn't be entirely wrong, would she? Velvet Remedy purred with just the right tone of sooth, soothing and embarrassment for the Pegasus. The partially collapsed firehouse tilted at an insane angle, making the entire world seem alien and threatening. Calamity, Velvet Remedy, and I scrambled across the maze of broken floors and leaning columns. Pyrelight swooped between floors, occasionally diving down to the bright red firehouse wagons that lay crushed and partially buried under swaths of flooring. A hellhound lurched into the doorway behind us, only to find Zenith waiting for it. A swift blow beneath the ribs froze the creature in place, paralyzing it. As it fell, a bolt of magical energy threw through the doorway, striking the zebra in the throat. She glowed brightly, and the orbs over our heads burst. Zenith fell, bleeding from a wound in her throat the size of a memory orb. Velvet Remedy struck the monster with an anesthetic spell, then rushed to Zenith, floating out her dress and using it to apply pressure to the wound. The dress was quickly ruined as it soaked with blood. Can I please kill him now? Calamity huffed. Velvet frowned, not saying anything. Zenith rasped. Yes, slowly, silently, and cut them open, the blood, smell. The hellhounds were hunting us, tracking us now clearly by scent. I understood what Zenith intended, as did Calamity. Velvet turned away, unwilling or unable to watch as we slew the two hellhounds. We made it quick, merciful. It was the least we could do, considering that we were about to defile their bodies. This ends any chance of diplomacy, Velvet moaned. I hesitated, floating a jagged piece of sheet metal out of the debris and positioning it over the hellhound's body. I had to disembowel him, spread his stink, cover our path with the stench of his death. It was vile. Slowly, I lowered the jagged metal, splashing out the hellhound's armored hide, slowly sawing into him. It was incredibly hard and at the reek was unbearable. I took what little comfort I could in knowing that at least he had died quickly and without pain. Corrupted kindness, the little pony in my head whispered in the voice of the goddess. Please no. By the time I was done, I felt sick to my stomach. I'd killed plenty, but this made me feel more like a raider. My mind conjured up the image of myself, bleeding, wearing raider armor. The image from the magical mirror.